First of all, I'd like to really welcome the family of Andrew and Louise. It's fantastic to have you all here, particularly in this venue, which is just a beautiful venue, I think, for in this sort of talk. I'm going to just say a few words. I'm Peter Hunter. I'm the director of the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Andrew is a member of both the ABI and the Engineering Science Department. Um, I want to just say a, a few words about Andrew's career, some of the things that he might not say himself, um, and then we'll quickly get into what looks like a really interesting topic. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that Andrew did his undergrad and right through to PhD and then in fact a lecturer at the University of Waikato um, and then came to the ABI, in fact just pre-ABI, just before the ABI was formed really in 1998, 2001, right at the time we were forming the ABI, he arrived from Waikato to do a postdoc and then um, was went off to be a postdoc and a research science scientist at MIT in Boston for six years. Um, and I, I took the liberty today of emailing the people that he interacted with at MIT, who I know quite well, um, when he was there, and um, that they asked me to, to just make the following comment. Um, Andrew has been a highly valued colleague and research collaborator for many years. My colleagues and I in the MIT Bioinstrumentation Lab were extremely sad when Andrew announced he was leaving MIT to return to New Zealand. You, you think they would have got over it by now. <laughs> um, however, Andrew returns to work in our lab on a regular basis and we always eagerly await his next visit. Andrew is truly an exceptional individual with skills in many areas of science and engineering. He has the quintessential Kiwi can-do attitude with a very strong work ethic and high level of creativity. We love his wicked sense of humour, his quick draw retorts when he senses pomposity and hubris, which I think we can all uh, relate to. Um, so after MIT, when he came back, we, we managed to extract him out of MIT in 2008, back to Auckland, where he took up a senior research fellowship, um, and then became both a lecturer in the engineering science department and a researcher in ABI. Um, and then his career really has built from there right through to the, the current um, height of his professorial appointment. He won three top teacher awards successively when he was um, at, in the engineering science department. So an extremely high, highly related, uh, highly awarded and, and appreciated teacher. Um, and of course his, his research activities in the ABI have been world leading in a number of areas that he's going to talk about. But I just mentioned that he's now our Associate Director for Research and we hugely appreciate the effort he puts into that job, which is a very big job. He's a James Cook Fellow, which is a real tribute to his research achievements to be awarded the, a James Cook Fellowship by the Royal Society of New Zealand. And um, in recognition of his teaching, I think he's a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Instrumentation and Measurement Society. So please join with me in welcoming Andrew and we look forward to his talk on making up. Okay, that doesn't help. Uh, kia ora tato. I whanau mai. Oki te kofai. Oh, from Huntley, I'm sorry. E tuko aki o ki te kofai. Ko peromia te moanga, ko waipa te awa, ko pakiha te iwi, ko Andrew Tamna toko inoa, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Uite patalofa atu, ilipaia, sorry, ilipaia, Male mamalu, o le tato ainga. Malo o lava, de sue fua lau lewi. E mamoli atua, le fafa afatai, i lo otu afifio mai, ma tala mai a au. Ua mau alanga le aso, ona ole tau awai mai, i le nai 
Faa moyo mo. Ya manu ya. Tele na tatu mafutana ile na aso. Fafutana. Thank you very much everyone. Um, that was me uh, of course introducing myself in, in Tereo and um, and in Samoan in honor of our Samoan guests, uh, my family, Ainga, uh, through Louise. And I, I thank you all for your attendance today at this uh, occasion. I'm really blessed that you've turned up and I'm very sorry that some of you have to stand. Um, but I, I, um, I very much appreciate you being here and I hope that you find the subject this evening uh, interesting and, uh, and stimulating um, as we work through the subject that I've chosen for tonight, which is making life better. So one of the things, when, when um, asked to give a talk about um, our research work, uh, new professors at the University of Auckland are invited to put their work into a broader context, and that's what I'd like to do today. Um, I'm very happy to talk at length about the technical side of what I do, but I'd really like tonight to try to provide a little bit of context um, to this work. And the photograph that I've chosen there is one from the March, the March for Science, which was held in 2017. And there I am with um, Bahare, um, one of our PhD students in LA, who came with me on that march. We, we felt the need to go and hold up a placard for science, because I don't know if you remember 2017, um, science and um, many of the principles that underpin science was under threat, mostly from the president of a large country on the other side of the Atlantic. But also, in general, I think um, the, the values that underpin our society have become less valued over time. And so a group of us wanted to make a stand for that. So I've added on to that science, evidence, reason and truth as being four principal values that I believe in, moderated with calmness and empathy and kindness. And I just want to point out, this was 2017, way before the Labour Party uh, or this present government picked up on the whole kindness thing. Um, but my soul, the sole time I appeared on Twitter was from this photograph, and Julian Genta took a photo and tweeted it. So there you go. That's where the later part we go from. Um, let me first um, also thank um, my sister Mary and her husband Lawrence for being here. I very much appreciate it. And for Joe and Sheldon, um, our family, for being here tonight. It's very much appreciated. Um, let me first pay my respects to my parents. Uh, who are no longer with us. Um, Peter, Peter Tabiner and Alice Parker were, I would say, not, not extraordinary people, but um, lovely parents to me and my sisters. And they brought us up with many of the um, values, I would say, that I showed on that placard. But amongst them, one of the key values that my parents stood for was a, a love for truth. And for them, that meant something quite specific, um, but that certainly stuck with me and with my family. And so I just want to honor my parents who, my dad died in 2015 and our mother died this year, um, one, one or two days before lockdown, the first lockdown. So we have still not had a family memorial for my mother, um, and I just want to honor them. I also want to honour my, um, my sisters, Kathleen, Gillian, Beth, and Mary. I come from a family of five, uh, with lots of estrogen in it, uh, and I'm, I am younger, the youngest of this bunch. And as I said in my pepeha, we were all born in Huntley, but uh, I grew up in Tepofai, which is a small town outside of Hamilton. I also want to pay my respects, my dearest respects, to my lovely wife, Louise, and our gorgeous daughter, India, in every way, uh, and, and I honour and respect them for the support that they have shown to me, uh, particularly in financing my, um, my academic career in its early parts, and uh, for their patience in, in um, as being with me on this journey that we're talking about tonight. So, now it's, that's the introductory bit, let's get on to the topic. Is life getting better or worse? Um, so, something like, uh, 18,000 adults across the world were asked this question, is life getting better or worse? And the response in China was 41% of people said, yep, life is getting better. But it turns out that the Chinese are the most optimistic. 
of the countries of the world, because here's the response from the others. And look, at, look at the bottom there, the bottom four or six in particular. It's the liberal Western democracies where life is already really good that don't think life is getting better. Now that may be, of course, because life is already so good that I can't imagine anything better than it is at the moment, and that may well be true. Um, but it's, it's striking that 41% uh, of Chinese, on the other hand, say life is getting better. So I'm from a, I'm from, I took my degrees in physics, so I care about measurement. And better or worse can be measured. And so this is the, uh, the patron, patron, if you like, or of the Instrumentation and Measurement Society, to which I belong. Um, William Thompson, who was Lord Calvin, after whom the, the temperature unit is named. Uh, and he said, to measure is to know. Now that's, that's a real scientist statement, um, that you can't really know something until you measure it, or at least once you have measured something, you know it. And so it turns out that whether life is getting better or not can be measured. And in social sciences, so I'm going to stray now from my field into a completely different field and talk about things that I'm interested in and I may not be expert in, but I'm referring to other people's data, so hopefully I won't make too many mistakes. So there is a thing called um, that human development can be measured or can be depicted as the freedom that we have as individuals when we have access to stuff that allows us to develop our personal potential. So that's the sort of qualitative statement. And so a thing called the historical index of human development is a measure of that. And it includes measures around the life expectancy, the access um, to information and literacy, education, and gross domestic product. And so this is often used by social scientists to measure whether life is getting better and how much progress different societies are making. So I am presenting data tonight that is lifted from a website called Our World in Data, and I highly recommend it to those who are interested in these topics. Um, this is not my data, I did not collect it. I hope you can see that on that chart, um, from 1870 through to 2015, the human index, sorry, the historical index of human development is positively increasing over time. That is, all of these countries that are depicted on this plot, uh, life is getting better. The most striking gains have been made in South Korea. Um, which after 1940 has gone through a rapid period of change and by all of these measures life has improved very measurably and quite profoundly. But in all countries on this plot and indeed in all countries of the world long term, life is getting better according to this measurement. I'll invite you to look up the details of how this is exactly computed. Note that New Zealand in 2015 is right at the top of this list. Of all countries, we have the highest index of human development on this list. That is, life is really good in New Zealand by this metric. Now, one of the main reasons for that is life expectancy, which forms a large component of the human index, of the historical index of human development. Here's the life expectancy um, from 1770 of a lot of different countries. Did you know, for example, that back in 1770, in most countries, the life expectancy of birth was about 28 years. So you had only an expectancy of 28 years in those days. If you survived the first few years, your life expectancy would go up quite a lot, as we'll see in a moment. New Zealand, again, tops this list in 2015. We have the highest life expectancy out of these countries, the United Kingdom, Denmark, um, etc., right down to um, past the Americas, China, etc. So, but notice how much it's gone up, particularly in the last 150 years since 1850. So such that today, the life expectancy at birth of men and women averaged is over 80 years of age. Let's drill down into this a little bit deeper. Here's the statistics for um, age in England and Wales. I choose this because my family is predominantly from England and Scotland, and these are relevant data. So at birth, uh, people in England 
back in 1750, had a life expectancy just a little over 35 years of age. And again, in 1850, that started to rapidly accelerate to where it is today. Of course, as you get older, um, your life expectancy increases because if you made it that far, chances are you're going to make it a bit further, right? Um, notice a few things, though. Here is a big dip in 1918. Now, what could that possibly be? Well, we're going through a pandemic at the moment, and that was the previous major influenza pandemic, the so-called Spanish influenza, which not afflicted, but killed between 1% and 5% of the world's population. Indeed, in New Zealand, we had something like 9,000 deaths in Black November, one, one or two months alone in 1918. 9,000 deaths, can you imagine that in this country? Well, how many we have from COVID-19? It's like 25, I believe. Now, Samoa, my, our family here, Aina from Samoa, was terribly afflicted, thanks to the New Zealand government, no less, who brought a military ship into their harbour and up here. They lost 22% of their population. The same number of deaths as New Zealand, but in tiny Samoa. Um, our great uncle, Frederick Parker, the, the, the brother of our grandfather died of um, so-called Spanish flu in Black November. He's buried in uh, Naroa here. And this is a, um, a monument at Tikora Marai in the Ropehu district um, to the 2,500 Maori who perished in the Spanish flu. Um, COVID-19 has taken 100 times fewer people from our planet than that influenza did. And that's a mark of the progress that we have made as a species, that we are not as afflicted. We are afflicted 100 times less because of the advances that we have made in medicine and in other areas um, in the last 100 years. Notice a couple of interesting things while we hear that Asiatic flu came out in about 19 or 1890. And those who suffered that, um, if they were younger, at the time, they were younger at the time, of course, were not afflicted by um, the Spanish flu. Sorry, I'm trying to find my mouse, and that's not going to work for me. But notice that in that top purple line, there's hardly a blip in the old people when the Spanish flu came along. Because they all lived, they were survivors of the Asiatic flu, so they had immunity. It's the young people who died in the Spanish flu, and it's a bit different from COVID-19. Uh, cholera took a whole bunch of people in 1850, and in uh, about 1730, there was a massive outbreak of bubonic plague in England. Let us talk about the people who didn't make it. So here's some of our ancestors. Mr. James Taverner was christened in 1723 at St. Mary's in uh, Lancashire, uh, but he died before 10th of August 1724 and was buried. His family had a, um, another son. Uh, Thomas Taverner, who was christened in 1725, but he died before the 1st of January of the next year, and he was buried. His twin brother, James, was born at the same time, of course, and he bore the name of his elder brother, who had already passed away, and just recycled the name. That's, that's what you did. So James uh, was christened, uh, but he died 1733. He, he made it to eight years old, at least. Um, and then Thomas II was born in 1726, Mary, that is our fifth great-grandfather. So he's the guy from whom our family are descended. Um, you can see the sort of perilous time that these people lived through um, in that outbreak of cholera. Here's a big picture view of the same issue. This is the child, um, global child mortality, so death. The share of the world's population dying and surviving the first five years of life. In red are those that died before they were five years old, and green is those who survived. In 1800, your chances of um, dying before you were five years old were about 44%. So 44% of children died before they turned five. Imagine being their parents. That's the life that people lived um, 200 years ago. Notice how much it has gone down, such that today, the share of children who die before they turn five is not quite vanishingly low, it's on a steady decline, but it's well under 
That's remarkable progress. Why has that happened? It's happened because we have got on top of the most lethal childhood diseases that afflict the human species. Uh, from the, This is just over the last 15, 25 years, sorry, 30 years, since 1990. Um, this is per the number of children who, who die from these diseases. Notice how the plots are going downwards. The human species, human beings, are getting on top of controlling these diseases, the most five lethal diseases. That's why we're living and surviving childhood much better than before. So uh, lower respiratory disease, which is kind of like an influenza, is, is still the leading cause of child mortality, but as you can see, it's come down almost threefold since 30 years ago. This has happened largely because the liberal Western democracies have made amazing strides in the treatment of these medical problems. So I just wanted to put this up. Uh, these are the uh, 10 most significant, according to um, Stephen Pinker in one of his books, but you'll see similar lists on other websites, um, of most significant medical advances that have saved the most lives. There's almost a billion lives that have been saved by these advances over the, the last century, from coronation down to drug design. Um, but notice the flags on the left there. Most of these, uh, apart from a couple from um, pre-war Germany, have arisen in the liberal Western democracies. And so I leave that with you as a thought as to why, what it is about our societies that has enabled this to happen. This allows me to gratuitously segue into my contribution uh, as modest as it may be, into a similar field. So I'm going to talk about needle-free drug delivery. And uh, this is where my PhD students, past and present, get to squirm a little bit. So jet injection is a, is a way of delivering drugs. In fact, it was originally used to treat um, smallpox. Um, and then they had a few issues with it, so they came up with another way of delivering smallpox. And there, there is no smallpox left in the world apart from in a couple of labs. Nobody today dies of smallpox because we eradicated it. Isn't that amazing? Um, so gen injection was used uh, initially in the fight against smallpox. So here's what gen injection is. I'm not gonna get too technical here, don't, don't freak out. But gen injection is where you take a device and you poke it up against your skin. And if you zoom in on the tip of the device, there's some liquid that gets squirted through a really small hole. And the hole is about as big as a human hair. It's really tiny. But the liquid, which is usually a drug, comes out so fast that it can puncture through your skin. And uh, you, you develop a nice high pressure on the liquid, and it gets up to 200 meters per second. Goes into your skin and delivers the drug. Uh, let me demonstrate. So this is a gin injector. Uh, Handily precharged by uh, James, our postdoc. It's got some water in it, it's not going to do anyone any harm. This is a typical gel injector that uses a spring. So have a watch, this is how fast the drug needs to be to get into your skin. Alright? And it sort of went into a spray, didn't it? Um, and, and sprayed everywhere. So, one of the things that I was working on with um, Professor Ian Hunter, who Peter referred to as his colleague from MIT, who is in fact his brother. Um, uh, worked on was to power one of these devices from an electric motor. So you're seeing a motor there on the right which we use to squirt the drug out. Now we, we handily have one of these motors here to demonstrate. And we've cunningly slowed it down so that it's not nearly as fast as that one. So when I fire this, you'll just see a stream of uh, water like that, but it shows you that that's absolutely silent, it makes no noise, because it's an electric motor that's just gently pushing on the drug, and that will deliver, this is not fast enough, but this device will deliver drugs um, up to 20 millimetres deep into your skin. So let me talk about the various students who have worked on this, this uh, work with me over the years. Reese is here, I'm not going to get him to put his hand up, we'll, we'll do that later. Um, so Rhys is a, is a graduate of our lab, and he worked on trying to understand how very viscous drugs, like honey almost, could be delivered into your skin. 
And what you're looking at there is actually a, 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 a video, high-speed video recording of some blue dye being injected into transparent tissue. So Reese did a whole bunch of maths and some computer modeling, and he found out that he could only explain what he was seeing by speculating that the drug was heating up. And that was great, and Reese got a PhD out of it. And then, not long after that, some people in our lab actually did a measurement of this. And what you're seeing on the right there is a video recording made with a, a video camera that can respond to temperature. So it's a thermal camera. And it's showing that Reese was exactly right. And in fact, as we squirt liquid drugs through our device, they heat up by about seven degrees around their surface. And that's what makes them slip through the device really easily, even though you probably couldn't push it by hand. James uh, is another guy from our lab um, who's sitting in the front row there. James worked on a really clever mechanism for delivering large volumes of drug, because some of the drugs that we use in modern, modern medicine um, need quite a large volume, and that's really difficult to deliver with a small device like this. So James worked on a device for doing that. He went to MIT and did some video recordings there. These are x-ray videos of drugs being squirted into um, post-mortem skin. Kieran, I'm going through these really quickly, sorry guys and, and girls, but um, Kieran uh, also worked in the jet injection group. He did some really clever stuff where he fired some light down through the jet as we were squirting it into the tissue. And I hope you can see this. As the jet goes into the tissue, the light is carried with it and it scatters off the, the tissue underneath the skin. And Kieran used some sensors, some light sensors on the surface of the skin and could figure out how deep that jet was penetrating into the skin while it was being delivered. Uh, Jali is in our lab currently. Uh, she's actually home sick today and, and happily didn't come in. Um, but she is working on using one of these injectors in reverse. So not only can our injectors squirt liquid into the skin, but they can actually suck back like a mosquito and pull out a little bit of blood and liquid and um, figure out what sort of um, blood glucose you might have or glucose concentration you have in your blood. Um, so that's Jali's PhD project. Baharin is working on ways to measure how much the blood is diluted when we suck it out of the hole in the skin. So she has developed an instrument there, which is a, a laser-based uh, dilution measurement device. But she's also um, creating some very clever sensors that enable us to measure blood glucose on that sample. And they're, they're a new type of sensor. They're a bit different from the ones that you use if you're diabetic today. And she's been working with Michael, who is uh, in the first year of his PhD, and he's figuring out ways of getting more blood out of the skin using some clever suction techniques and integrating these into a portable device for treating diabetes. So these are um, examples of the um, devices that we've created in our lab. Uh, actually, the one on the right is a commercial device. Um, so what are we doing with it? We're using it at the moment, uh, about to begin a clinical study to um, inject dental anesthetic for um, children um, and adults down at Otago, or with Otago University and AUT. We've been delivering nicotine to help smokers quit smoking. If you want a, a quick hit of nicotine, you don't have to have a cigarette, you just have a needle-free injection. And that can work in places like prisons, where you're not allowed to smoke. Um, you potentially, you could have a, a jet injector to give you a nicotine burst. Sorry, I'm pointing at my brother-in-law because he works, he works in a prison. <laughs> <laughs> and not, not because he's a prison. <laughs> Um, we're also working, as I said, on insulin injection for diabetes management and commercialization. Okay, so let me continue. Um, cardiovascular disease is another major killer of human beings. The major killer. Uh, it kills um, something like 18 million human beings per year. So these are diseases of the heart. And um, our family are not immune to this. So this is our grandfather, who I never met, um, Oliver Parker. He died in 1959, um, 10 years before I was born. Um, and he died suddenly after chasing cows around the field because he was a farmer. And uh, they subsequently discovered that he had severe atherosclerosis. So that's hardening of the arteries of the heart. My mother, um, about 22 years ago, was diagnosed with a similar condition. Now, fortunately, she figured it out before having a heart attack. She, was, she could hardly walk to the letterbox. 
And it turned out that she had very severe hardening of her arteries and clogged up of her arteries. Uh, fortunately, she, due to medical advances, she could have a bypass operation, which she had, and she lived another 20 years, 20 years until this, this year. Um, this is me. I was born in 1969, and if things go to plan, um, I might make, it, make my way to 2056. So, <laughs> that is my life expectancy, apparently. Um, so, but because I know I have a family history of heart disease, we can, we can do something about this, right? To measure is to know, says uh, Lord Kelvin. And so, back in uh, 2006, I started measuring. So I'll just, these are measurements of my cholesterol concentration. The blue one is the bad one. You want the blue one to be below the dotted line, right? So here I am. Um, in 2009, my doctor put me on statins. It's a very common medication for lowering blood cholesterol. And it, it worked a bit. It brought me down to the two, the two line, which is good, but not good enough. So I like, cut it along until I got to 2018. And my doctor got fed up with it. And she said, right, we're going to get you and put you in one of these machines. So she stuck me in a CT machine and did a scan of my heart. And lo and behold, a whole bunch of white stuff. Now that's not the stuff you want to see if you go in for a so-called coronary CT. Uh, this scan shows a whole lot of white stuff on the scans. And here's the report that the doctor kindly returned to my doctor, the heart specialist. He said, well, there's an extensive amount of calcific atherosclerotic, so this is the stuff that I don't want, clogging up my arteries, it's what killed my grandfather. Uh, moderate to severe amount of plaque, the lifetime risk of a cardiovascular event is high, and your score is 483. Well, I had no idea what that meant, so I looked on a chart. So, um, what it means basically is that I have the heart of the average 78-year-old white male, and I'm 50 years old. So, but I know this now, right? I've had the scan done. There's nothing that can be done to reverse calcification. Once you've got it, it's kind of there. But you can lower your cholesterol and try and manage the condition so it doesn't get worse. Uh, so I'm in the 99th percentile, for those of you who want to know, for my age group. Um, yeah, too many pies or something. Um, but it's also familial high cholesterol from my family. Um, so that's OK. Uh, my doctor put me on a thing called azetamine. And that has brought my cholesterol right down to the vanishing low level of 1.4. And again, I, I tell you this uh, not to elicit sympathy, but just to show how much we have advanced as a society and can treat these conditions and do the best that we can. And you know, with a bit of luck, I can manage this condition, avoid a heart attack, and uh, get a transplant. Oh, sorry, a plant <laughs> if need be. Which brings me nicely to my second area that I want to talk about in my work, which is studying the heart. This is why I joined the University of Auckland um, from the University of Waikato. So we study hearts. These, this is a heart from a rat. You believe it or not, you can take a heart from an animal, like a rat, and you can keep it alive for hours and hours, as long as you give it oxygen and as long as you keep feeding it the nutrients that it needs. And so we study tissues from this heart. And so on the right, we're showing some very small pieces of tissue that we take out of living hearts. And we can study those tissues. They're nice little engines that you use, excite them, and they perform work and do useful things. So um, I've spent a long, I've spent twenty something years now building instruments that look a bit like this, which I'm not going to talk about, except to show you what they look like. And some of our very talented students and postdocs use these tools. They're for studying these little muscle fibers that are again about the size of a human hair. They're very, very thin, and they're only about two millimeters long. Really, really small, but we can learn a lot about the heart by studying them. So we can, for example, look at the spark that produces force in the heart, and that's called that's an ion called calcium. So we can study the calcium release and the force that it produces. We can look at how the tissue shortens and scan its shape in um, three dimensions using a special scanning device. Sorry about the whistling. I can't do anything about it here if it's coming from me. Um, and we can watch that muscle as we excite it over and over, like it does in our hearts, as our heart beats, beat after beat. So this instrument allows us to measure all of these things, and, and I like to refer to it as a dynamometer. So it's, it's like the device that, if you've got a sports car, 
you go and put it on a dyno, right? That's the, the tool that you drive onto and you spin your wheels up and it measures up how much power your sports car creates. And that's what this device does for heart muscle. It also measures the heat that is produced by the heart using some very sensitive temperature sensors. We wash liquid over the heart muscle and as it washes over the muscle, it warms up just a very tiny amount and that's enough to tell us how much energy the heart is consuming, or the heart muscle is consuming. And uh, we, here's a model showing the heat, the plume of heat that is released by the muscle once we, we make it produce force. And this allows us to do a whole bunch of measurements like this, and these are the people who do it. So I've just about finished the science part of my talk, that was fantastic. So the, I want to really acknowledge the, the very talented people who have helped build these instruments. Um, they are postdocs from our, uh, sorry, they're PhD students from our lab, particularly um, on the top are my colleagues, Paul Nielsen, Brian Reddy, and Dennis Lazal, who helped to build these instruments. Um, Frederick von Halsbeek helped to build the imaging devices. But the other people that are essentially uh, on the top line are phys uh, engineers and physiologists who, who lead the experiments that we do. Um, Alex, who I'm delighted is here today, and his colleague Callum, and Ming, all worked on building the instrument that you saw. Um, I'd be delighted to talk about that in a separate talk, but it's a bit technical and I didn't really want to go into it today. And the others are people who have contributed to it, and of course lots of people funded this, this, um, this work. I want to talk, though, first of, uh, furthermore, on the, the people who are currently using the tools in our lab that were built up over 20 years, which are unique and their contribution. So you're seeing a bunch of them here, and I think almost all of them are here today. Um, so together, our lab has produced something like, it's almost 50 journal articles over the last um, 10 or so years um, from this work on understanding heart muscle. Now, I don't expect you to understand these titles, because even though I'm one of the authors, I scarcely understand it. But basically what I'm showing is that Using these very sophisticated tools, we can look at how heart muscle changes when it is diseased, and because some animals can be bred so that they have a disease, and we can understand with this tool how the heart muscle is being changed. We can look at how their diet, if you feed an animal a certain type of food, how does that affect its um, performance? Uh, so I wanted to um, acknowledge Jun Chu and Kenneth and Tyne, who are three of the authors on these papers, amongst many, and, and Dennis, of course, who is always there somewhere on the scene. Uh, back, back to my students, current students in our lab, Jara is uh, doing some work on measuring calcium and uh, force on muscle. You won't be able to see it very well, but there's a piece of tissue there in that video below there that all of a sudden starts changing the way that it contracts. And, and Jara is trying to understand, by making all of these measurements, how heart muscle changes when you rapidly change what you're asking it to do. Say, for example, you start to exercise very heavily, the heart has to respond quickly, and Joe is studying effects like that. Um, Amy, whoa, sorry, Amy is, um, she's extending the analogy of a dynamometer. She's looking at how the heart performs as you electronically control how much work it has to do. And she changes a load, the load that the heart experiences, which is kind of like how much it has to push as it tries to pump blood around the body. And she can um, use her device to um, explore the changes in heart function as you change its, uh, the work it's asked to do. Emily has been taking very tiny individual cells from a heart. Now, cells are smaller, again, they're, they're only about 120 microns long, so that's, again, it's about the diameter of a human hair, and they're incredibly tiny, but they're little motors that you can study one by one. And Emily has been putting these motors in something that's like jelly, and watching them under the microscope, as studying them under the microscope using some very clever techniques um, developed by Amir, um, and used by others and developed by others in our lab. Um, to enable us to study many heart cells at once. At least that's where we're heading. And Julia is measuring the stiffness of heart muscle. So she wiggles the muscle in a device. This tells us, or tells her about the stiffness of that muscle. And she gets uh, that information and she tries to build mathematical models. That's not her model there, that's a very fancy animation. But uh, 
uh, Julia is building mathematical models of how that heart muscle works uh, in supervision, under the supervision of Kenneth, and I should add that JC supervises also um, Jeremy. So that's all the science, folks. Um, if you came just for the science, you can probably leave now. Let's get back to the topic. Um, but these are these seriously these advances I think that we are making in our lab are telling us more about how the heart works, and I think in future, if not now, prolonging our lives. I want to now reflect on one of the other attributes of the human index, the historical index of human development, and that is education. Um, so here's a plot showing how many people were literate in the world versus those who were illiterate, didn't know how to read or write over time. In 1800, almost 90% of the world's population, no matter what country you were in, could neither read nor write. Um, in 2016, um, that number is more like 10%. There are still many illiterate people in the world. Um, let's look at it country by country. Um, England is interesting. Uh, the United Kingdom, it's the yellow one. Yeah. In, in 1820, it surprised me to learn that only about 12% uh, of English people could read and write, or write, um, back in 1820. Quite surprising. At that same time, or shortly thereafter, when um, New Zealand, Aotearoa, uh, was beginning to be colonised, the colonisers um, had a pretty good education system. Of course, they didn't offer it to Māori. Uh, necessarily, but they had uh, well over 50% of their population in New Zealand who could read and write, um, and so on. So it's, it's very interesting that New Zealand's got a very high-performing education system and has, has done so for the last 200 years, and it's taken other countries a long time to catch up. Here is Mary. Mary here is our uh, great-grandfather, Thomas Taverner. So he's the great-grandson of Thomas II, who survived cholera. Um, According to our grandfather, Thomas had meagre schooling. He could barely write his name. He could read a little bit. And so he began working at age 11 in a coal mine in, in Lan Lancashire, in the, uh, not, not far from Wigan. Uh, he, he, as my grandfather said, he wasn't very robust, so he quickly taught himself how to do tinsmithing, and he made lamps for the miners to use. And uh, so he started his own business to get out of the coal mine. His first wife died when he was, she was age 28 of, um, this is basically childbirth. Um, his second wife died giving birth to a son. Or so, sorry, she gave birth to a son and died before that son was two years old. Uh, and so Thomas then married Ellen Tavena, our grandmother. Uh, she was his third wife, naturally. She had no schooling. She could not write. She could read a little. And here is her signature, so the cross there, right on the bottom right, that's her signature on their marriage certificate. It says her mark, so she just wrote a little cross. She couldn't read or write. Uh, but she had the virtue that she was already a taverner. How fantastic is that? So in the town of Pemberton in the UK, there are so many taverners that you could go out and marry one if you were a taverner. Um, because were, it's the only town in the UK where our family lived. Um, but the, so the density there is extremely high, and, and so Thomas decided he would just marry a taverner, and it worked. So that's, that's who we are descended from. Uh, I show you this photo solely for the reason that this is Alan Taverner's family. There she is on the bottom right. And I want to draw your attention to the names of the three gentlemen on the back row. Tom, Dick, and Harry. <laughs> Isn't it? That's gold. So this is one of our family photo albums. Tom, Dick and Harry fan Tavern, all from the same family. Just fantastic. On the other side of our family, uh, my, my mother's ancestor, Rosetta Watts, um, fled from England to Australia in um, 1862, pregnant, without her husband, because it turns out her husband was a bigamist and was already married to someone. So she fled to Sydney, and she married again and moved to Onehonga in 1870, where she ran a grocery store on the main street of Onehonga. Her son, our great grandfather, George, was uh, shipped to Raglan at nine years old. He did you know, the equivalent of four years of uh, school, and he was shipped to work on a flax farm in Raglan, and he never went back to school. So I tell you this, these stories, he earned three shillings a week, by the way, which is about $100 today. 
Um, I tell you these stories just to show how much education has changed, even in our, our Western societies, and how appreciative we should be for that, because economic growth is strongly correlated with education. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on these things, and I don't know that anyone can claim that uh, one causes the other, or in what, what um, order that happens, but definitely they're strongly correlated. And this has been one of the main reasons why the world population living in extreme poverty is plummeting. So green here represents the number of people over time not living in extreme poverty, which has a definition that can be used to compare over time, which I can't go into at the moment. Red shows you the number of people who are in extreme poverty. In 1820, 90% of the world's population lived in by today's definition, extreme poverty. In their terms, not just in our terms, 90%. Today, the numbers of people living on planet Earth who, who meet the definition, scaled according to the era, of extreme poverty is less than 10%. Amazing statistic. Putting it another way, um, here's the total population of planet Earth between 1820 and 2015. Again, all these data come from this website, our world data. Um, Today there are about 7 million of us, and uh, the number who live in extreme poverty has plunged over the last 20 or 30 years. So much so that if you're a mathematician and you fit a slope to that, you figure out that 137,000 people every day of our lives have been lifted from extreme poverty to poverty. Now that's, okay, that's not terrific, but that's some kind of success. Those numbers are staggering. 137,000 people every day lifted out of extreme poverty, I think is um, remarkable. Obviously, it's still a long way to go, um, but a remarkable achievement. Thanks, um, actually, to largely to the government uh, the, um, of uh, China and also um, India. The advances that we have made over the last 100, uh, 200 years, I think, can be attributed to our ability to harness energy. I'm just about to wrap things up, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Um, our ability to harness energy and knowledge to better our lot. Uh, for many years, we lived in something that was referred to as the Malthusian economy. I won't go into detail on that. George Bush then said, now we're making the pie higher. What we actually, he actually meant was we're making the pie larger, but you know, George Bush says we're making the pie higher. And since 1800, because we have harnessed energy and found ways to use it usefully, um, that is largely, I believe, why we are so much better off now. Here is the Gini Index of Global Inequality, just in case you were wondering about these issues, um, showing over four years between 2000, well, 1988 and 2008, how the yearly income per person across the world is moving to the right, and it is becoming more equal. The Gini index is dropping. That means that the world is becoming a more equitable place overall. Now, within societies, of course, that's not necessarily true, but overall, the world is becoming more equal. Thanks largely, of course, to the prosperity of China and India. Okay, which leads me to my last real topic on this. Um, how has this happened, and does this make us happier? Um, and these are some quotes. A lot of Spike Milligan's one. Money can't buy you happiness, but it does bring you a more pleasant form of misery. Um, and so, why is that, that once we become wealthier, we become happier? And I'll show you, I hope, some compelling statistics that show that it is true. Um, and this is something I was talking about with um, my, my great colleague, Marty Nash, during the week. The, these inventions on the top line, they seem trivial. The, the washing machine, the refrigerator, the vacuum cleaner, the freezer, dryer, the water heater, etc. These plots show you the prevalence of these appliances in the American world. Um, those appliances have cut the number of hours that we as families spend on household chores from 60 hours a week to less than 19 hours per week across the household. That's incredible. And this is something that Ian, Ian Anderson's going to be talking about when he does his talk in a couple of weeks, that so much hassle has been removed from our lives by these inventions. And so here's a thought experiment for you. The washing machine, the clothes washer, has made an enormous impact on 
particularly for women who carried this burden for many years while their husbands tended to be down the coal mine, um, of washing clothes, um, has relieved them of that duty and, and liberated so many of their hours. But which household appliance could you not live without? Think about that for a moment. And, and um, Stephen Bicker in his book points out that most families today can buy a refrigerator for about $1,000, but would be willing to pay probably more like $10,000 in order to keep it, right? It's cheap to buy, but boy, is it valuable. There's a difference between cost and value, isn't there? Refrigerators, I mean, who, who wants to live without a refrigerator? You can live without a washing machine by taking to the laundry, but I don't think many of us would want to live without a fridge. A weekly work hours, my great-granddad worked for 60 hours as a coal miner. Um, now in most of the countries, it's down to 40 hours a week. People in richer countries tend to be happier, and within all countries, richer people tend to be happier. That's according to the data that have come from many different surveys. The happiest countries uh, on the top left, on the top right of that plot, tend to be the Nordic countries. New Zealand is up there, right near the top. But there's also a bunch of South American countries who, um, despite not having enormously high incomes, are still pretty happy. So they do pretty well at converting um, income into happiness. Here's another way of looking at it. Self-reported life satisfaction. If you want to know how happy people are, just ask them. It's a good, good thing to do. Self-reported um, happiness. New Zealand, uh, the Zealanders are actually a really happy bunch. And perhaps we don't appreciate this because we're so consumed by other negativities in our lives. Um, again, it's very similar distribution to the others. The Nordic countries in the top left, followed by New Zealand. And the share of people who say they are happy or rather happy, very happy or rather happy, is very high in New Zealand. We're the second on this list, just below Sweden in 2014. I checked, I did some fact checking. You should not take anything I say for granted, of course, you should check your facts. And don't believe anything I tell you without checking your facts. If you go and check your facts on this one, I found that the World Happiness Report listed us as eighth in the world for happiness. So in answer to the question, well, does all of this stuff make us happier? The answer is yes, the data say that it does. So I'm going to wrap up now on what I wanted to say. Thank you so much for your patience. And here's my summary. Life expectancy is continuously increasing. It has at least doubled in the last two centuries. Healthcare is better than ever. Um, New Zealand has one of the best healthcare systems in the world. Despite the moaning that you'll hear about it, we are very fortunate in this country to have a very good and efficient healthcare system. We haven't talked about this because I haven't had time, but I could talk for another hour about this topic. The rates of suicide, homicide, and death by warfare are at historical lows. We have been living through a period in, the, in our lifetimes that uh, is referred to by historians as the long peace. For, for millennia, nations, superpowers have been fighting each other, but since World War II, there have only been a, a very small handful of major wars with very historically low casualties, and that may be quite surprising. Leisure time, travel, entertainment, the information that we have, the food that we have, our freedoms, our rights, our knowledge are all increasing by every measure that I have seen. And so my conclusion is, uh, first of all, Flavor Flag, those of you who may know Flavor Flag, said don't believe the hype. And there's a lot of hype in our media, right? Media, whether it's social or news media, is designed to excite us and to scare us. And there is hype to grab our attention. Check your facts. Uh, and that's what Louise always tells me. Um, I think we had a good ground to be skeptical about what we hear, but optimistic um, based on this evidence alone. An anecdote is not a trend. Remember that. Just because something's bad today does not mean it was better in the past. Uh, so keep your perspective, value your values, which I think are those things on the right, those are the things I value, and be appreciative because I believe life has never been better. Peter's standing there as if he wants to take over the stage, but I've got some more to say. So this is where I finish my talk. I really thank you for your patience. Um, and now I want to conclude with a few statements about people. I want to acknowledge a couple of really great professors from the University of Waikato. It's a tragedy that um, their department was dissolved. Um, Professor Alistair Steinross and Professor Dale Carney were two fantastic educators from the University of Waikato. Um, they both sort of work in the New Zealand education system. 
but they were terrific, inspiring teachers. Barry Carruthers is New Zealand's probably least known genius. He's an amazing guy. Before there was John Britton, there was Barry Carruthers. Barry Carruthers died this year. In, um, I can tell you some great stories about Barry. I was fortunate to work for him for a few years. And um, he was a, just a terrific inventor, inventor and a real genius of a man. Stunning um, clever. But he was, he was a shepherd first and foremost, who then ran his own business, and still his son now runs New Zealand's only thick film and electronics com company. Just a genius. Uh, Gary Lambert was a fine maker of uh, loudspeakers, who I did my PhD work with, and um, I listen to those every day. <laughs> now these two gentlemen, I, I really want to take my hat off to them and acknowledge the enormous contribution that they've made to my career. Um, so some of you may not recognise them. So that's Janice Lazelle on the left and Paul Nielsen on the right. This may help a few of you. This is um, and uh, Professor Peter Hunter. Now, one of the proudest moments of my life was when um, Professor Peter Hunter and Professor Paul Nielsen and um, Professor Dennis Lazelle hopped into their car and came down to from the University of, to the University of Waikato to, to interview me in my lab in, in Waikato for a job that I was applying for in all of them. They came down to interview me. I couldn't believe it. Um, and I was by far the best dressed, which is saying something, <laughs> saying something when you're in the University of Waikato. Um, but uh, uh, truly, Dennis and, and Paul are outstanding people, as we all know, and um, I'm absolutely grateful for the opportunities that they've given me under, of course, the watchful eye of, of our, our wonderful distinguished Professor Hunter, who leads our institute. I'd also like to acknowledge his wonderful brother, Professor Ian Hunter, who is just as distinguished as Peter, even though his job title is slightly different. Um, he's got a better moustache. <laughs> Ian's had a profound influence on my career to acknowledge the wonderful things he's done. Also, um, my wonderful colleague, uh, Professor Marty Nash. So these are people who I have published with a lot over the years. Um, these are more gender diverse, as you would note. Um, You'll be keen to see that, Julie. Um, so these are the wonderful people that I have um, published with from MIT and the University of Auckland, who I thank very much. And I, I particularly want to thank um, uh, all of those. I particularly want to single out uh, Brian Reddy, Dr. Brian Reddy, who I've done a lot of work with since he was at MIT, and uh, Dr. James McKee, um, who James now does a lot of work in our lab that I'm very grateful for um, taking some load off me. Jun Chu and um, Kenneth, and time, you're all, of course, equally important to me. This is a wonderful photo from 1999. I can just about make out Maren's face at the back there. Um, so I just want to point out a few wonderful people here. Um, Professor Nick Smith is on the back row, third from the left. Next to him is Andre, those of you who know David Nickerson, and Andrew Pollard. But further down, uh, Richard Christie. On the bottom right, we've got Leo Cheng, Glenn Malcolm, Maren Tafai, and uh, there's a Toby guy on the second left there. Um, I want to acknowledge Mary uh, in particular for her outstanding um, deputy leadership of the ABI, but, but her um, leadership as, a, as an academic is profound and influential. I'd like to thank um, Rosalind Archer, of course, who was the head of our department for many years, and uh, the, the former and current heads of our department, uh, Andrew Paul and Matthias Erbacht and Piers Kelly. Uh, Andrew encouraged me to apply for a teaching position, and I'm grateful for him for doing that. The administrators, um, Nina and, and Mary, and all, all the wonderful people on the right there who make life better for us all at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Thank you so much for all that you do to make life good for us. It's very much appreciated by us all. Finally, this is my last two or maybe three slides. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, the wonderful PhD students. Um, former PhD students, mostly on the, or many, many former on the top line, and some still current. Um, you are, as I've said many times, uh, like family to me, um, because one of the cool things about being in a university appointment is that you develop relationships as you see people grow, and I'm very grateful for your contributions to my career, and hope that I've made your life better in some way too. These are the PhD students I've co-supervised, or still co-supervised. Again, thank you all to you, you're equally as, as valuable, although our relationship is slightly different from my main students. At least that's what I tell Paul. Um, <laughs> and uh, the master's students I've supervised. 
And finally, and this is the honor call of the honors students that I've supervised in the 12 years being back at University of Auckland. Thank you so much for your attention and your patience. I can have to recruit this guy, I think you can see. Um, I think what all, all, many of the greatest discoveries in science are made because someone thinks of a new way of measuring something. And I think what you've seen tonight is a perfect example of the importance and the creative genius of instrument making, building new ways of measuring things. But I think what Andrew has also shown, and very much shown his own humanity is the reason why doing those measurements is so important and I think he's given us a pretty optimistic uh, view of our life in New Zealand in the future. So thank you very, very much Andrew.